You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is January 13, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, asthma and the elderly. Our presenter is Dr. Mark Sirota. He's an allergy immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. So Dr. Sirota, of course, is one of our second-year uh, allergy fellows here at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics, and he's stepped in twice now. So thank you so much, Dr. Sirota. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch the slides over to Dr. Sirota's presentation. Uh, it's called Asthma in the Elderly. Here's your thank keyboard, you. and you've got your mouse. So uh, take it away, Dr. Sirota. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Porter. So, oops, no, order. there we go. So I have no disclosures other than the fact that I'm a pediatrician, not internal medicine trained. So I'm talking about asthma and allergies in the elderly, but I am a pediatrician. Uh -oh. <laughs> Do you know anything about yeah. elderly? People? Elderly for me is like 18. <laughs> uh, so the objectives for this talk, uh, at the conclusion of the talk, uh, I'd like you to be able to describe the features of the aging lung. Uh, explain how asthma in the elderly differs from asthma in children and young adults, and devise a logical approach to the diagnosis of an elderly patient with respiratory complaints. Uh, so just have, uh, two really quick uh, pre-test questions here. Uh, the first one is asthma-related deaths are more common among children compared to the elderly. So that would be true or false. And number two is, uh, I would not expect an elderly COPD patient to have a positive methacholine inhalation challenge. So would that be true or false? Would you not expect uh, an elderly COPD patient to have a positive methacholine? Uh, so just some overview facts. Uh, the proportion of persons older than 65 in the U.S. is 13%, which is around 40 million. And that's projected to grow to 25% or 86 million by 2050. So a very significant percent of the population today and in the future are older than 65. Uh, the age group with the largest growth will be those older than 85, more than 1 million by 2050. So even those that are what I would consider, you know, even a subset of elderly patients older than 85 are still uh, growing and going to become more prevalent. Uh, older asthmatics are more likely to be underdiagnosed undertreated and hospitalized than younger asthmatics. And older asthmatics have the highest death rate of all age groups. So 51.3 per million persons uh, with an asthma death rate. Uh, older women are hospitalized twice as often as older men. So when you think about at-risk asthma patients, the elderly are at greater risk. And among the elderly, elderly women are at an even greater risk than elderly men. Uh, so just some general principles to go over with respect to aging and, and the aging lung. Aging itself is not a disease, so aging is expected, and there are certain physiological changes that you expect as a person ages. Of course, uh, if we ever find a cure for aging, then it will be a disease. Right? <laughs> so it's not a disease because we don't know what to do about it. It could be a disease. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are, there are certain physiologic changes within organs, tissues, and cells that result in diminished functional reserve resulting in increased susceptibility to stressors, to disease, or both. Uh, so while it's not a disease itself, it still increases uh, your risk of certain uh, disease states. And there is great heterogeneity with regard to aging among older individuals. Um, and they, they describe uh, older fit people and older frail people. So, so how uh, individual response to the aging process differs uh, among different people. So molecular damage accumulates over time, and the capacity for DNA repair decreases. And after a finite number of divisions, normal somatic cells invariably enter a state of irreversibility, of irreversibly arrested growth called replicative uh, senescence. So basically, um, your cells have a finite number of divisions that they have. And it's not so much the amount of time that they are exposed to, but the amount of divisions that they're exposed to. So they've actually done studies where they froze cells and, and you know put them in a state of suspended animation and when they when they re were resuming uh, uh, their, their um, 
mitosis and division, they still underwent the same number of divisions, even though they've been alive for a much longer period of time. So it's not so much time as it is division itself. And it's actually called the half-life limit. It's the num total number of divisions that a cell can undergo. So at the cellular level, uh, level, escape from the regulators of senescence leads to malignant transformation. Uh, loss of the prolif uh, proliferative capacity of human cells in culture is intrinsic to the cells and not dependent on outside factors. And the number of cell divisions, like I said, is more important than the amount of time that has passed. So, you know, when, I, when you read this, you kind of think maybe like the fountain of youth is actually malignancy, you know, where cells are free from, from that finite number of divisions. So within the lungs, the FEV1 and FBC both show continuous decreases of between 25 and 30 milliliters with each year of life after age 20. And that's normal and expected. So just every year of life you live after age 20, you're going to lose lung function, and that's a normal physiologic process. Uh, this is commonly attributed to the reduced respiratory muscle performance and loss of static <laughs> elastic recoil. So it's, it's chest wall performance and the loss, loss of recoil on the lung. Stiffening of the chest wall and reduced respiratory muscle performance results in a decrease in total lung capacity and an increase in residual volumes. And aging processes lead to airflow limitation that might be hard to distinguish from an active disease process. So you have to decide in your mind, is this consistent with a nor just normal aging lung like I just outlined, or is it something that's an actual disease process? Uh, not all older persons are able to perform spirometry um, for several reasons decreased cognition, decreased coordination, that kind of frailty phenotype that we talked about. And, you know, they can also tire quickly and have poor effort. So kind of think of it as, as the young kids we do when you're five, six, seven, and we're trying to get you to do it. There's some similar problems to when you're um, aging. Bronchodilator responses are known to be less marked in the elderly, although results have been mixed in various studies. And methacholine responsiveness has been reported to increase with age. And that's an unknown mechanism. But basically, uh, the aging lung is more prone to responding to methacholine for unknown reasons. So it's not as reliable of a test in the elderly. The presence of comorbid COPD increases the risk of an asthma-related hospitalization in Medicare patients 3.6-fold, and respiratory medical costs 6-fold, and total medical costs 2-fold. And a lot of these patients may have had underlying uh, asthma, and then they were smokers and developed COPD. We see this pretty commonly in the adult world. And it, it's a significant problem that increased medical costs. Uh, so asthma mortality, what's been the pattern over the past few decades, it's increased from 1980 and peaked in 1998. The highest mortality rates for asthma occur in the 65 and older group. And remember, that's the group that's going to be expanding as the years go on and people live longer. The increase in asthma mortality between 1979 and 1989 was driven by that 65 and older group. So again, when you see patients and you're kind of stratifying them in your mind, older than 65, female, that is going to set off a red flag that they're at the highest risk. And the decrease in asthma mortality from 1999 to 2005 was, again, most prevalent in that 65 and older group. And that's, I think, been since they've identified this group as higher risk and been more aggressive with their therapy and recognized that they do have underlying disease that needs to be treated, and not just that they're getting older or that they're frail. So the pathophysiology uh, in terms of aging and asthma, it's actually still pretty poorly understood and definitely understudied. Um, but there's certain questions that you can consider. Is asthma the same disease in older adults as it is in children and younger adults? And is late onset asthma that starts in middle age or older different from longstanding asthma? So is the patient that's had asthma since they were 10 and now they're 65, that patient different physiologically than a patient that developed asthma when they were 50 or 55? And I think the answer to that question is yes, but the studies are lacking. Uh, there is a role of airway inflammation. Older asthmatic patients are less responsive to albuterol treatments given in the ED. And immunosenescence, immune cell function decrease over time. So these all kind of go along with the aging process. But older asthmatics don't respond as well to albuterol. Uh, there's also the effect on T cell function with respect to aging, and it really depends on the stimulus. Uh, for example, uh, viral stimulus, you would normally expect them to have more of a Th1 uh, phenotype, whereas allergen, for example, you'd expect them to have a Th2 phenotype. Um, but those 
those signals aren't necessarily as robust as they are in a in a younger person. So as you get older, your your immune cells shift to different patterns, and it's not necessarily what you would expect for a younger person. So they they do have kind of a difference in the inflammation in their lungs, put simply. So when they examine the cellular composition of uh, bronchiovular lavage fluid from, uh, from <laughs> patients age 19 to 83, and these are patients without allergies, without underlying pulmonary disease or GERS, this is just like the state of affairs in, in their lungs. In the elderly uh, patients that they looked at those these fluids in, they had increased airway neutrophilia, increased CD4 cells number, increased CD4 uh, cell activation, and increase in those two haplotypes. So basically, just with normal aging, they have these, these uh, immune markers and inflammatory cells that are increased in numbers in their BAL fluid, and these are patients without any underlying disease. In another study, peripheral blood eosinophil uh, effector functions, where they looked at degranulation and superoxide production, were diminished in the elderly compared to younger asthmatics. And in another study, there's decreased baseline neutrophil expression of leukotriene B4 in the sputum of older asthmatic patients despite greater neutrophil numbers. So basically what this is trying to say is that you can't just rely on, on the numbers of cells. You also have to look at what they're doing functionally. And as you can see, it's altered in, in the elderly patient population. Right, that's one implication of that, exactly. So what do all these results add up to? Well, right now, to be honest, the implications are not well understood. We know these are there are these physiologic differences, these cellular differences, but no one's sure, no one's sure exactly how much they're contributing to the difference in the phenotypes. Um, it does suggest there's age-related changes in the function of inflammatory cells related to asthma, and it raises the question whether additional effects of immunosenescence are relevant to airway inflammation that haven't been fully worked out yet. So what's the role of allergy in adult in uh, elderly patients with asthma? Uh, nasal and ocular symptoms due to allergens we know diminish with age. Uh, Allergen-triggered asthma symptoms do also diminish with age. And according to the Tenor study, which is the epidemiolog epidemiology and natural history of asthma study, older asthmatic patients have lower total IgE levels, fewer positive skin prick tests, and less concomitant allergic rhinitis or atopic dermatitis. So what I would take from all that is when you think of allergies uh, triggering asthma or related to asthma, it's certainly still possible in the elderly population. It's something you should consider, but it's less of a problem than it is compared to the pediatric patients or young adult patients that we treat. So allergic triggers uh, appear to be less relevant compared to younger asthmatics, as I just said, and irritants and respiratory tract infections appear to be more relevant. Estimates suggested up to 80% of asthma exacerbations in adults are caused by viral URI. That's not to say you shouldn't be thinking of allergies, but if you want, if you're going to put your money where the largest uh, chance of, of what their triggers are going to be, it's going to be viral URIs. Studies of the general population suggest uh, causation between allergen exposure and asthma. And when age of onset is considered, asthma with an early onset, which they defined as less than 41 years of age, has a much higher association with positive allergy tests than late onset asthma. So again, when you're seeing a patient and you're stratifying them in your mind, we said already 65 and older female is the highest risk for mortality. 41 and younger, you stratify that in your mind as thinking, this is a patient I'd be more worried about allergic triggers in. I'm, I'm going to maybe go a little bit deeper, whereas the older patient population, you're more worried about viral triggers and not allergic triggers. So the diagnosis for asthma in the elderly, um, I think as specialists, we think this is fairly straightforward, but it turns out to be fairly complicated when you consider all the comorbidities elderly patients can have. Um, so in general, you should be thinking about episodic wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, often worse at night and with exertion, and often precipitated by upper respiratory tract infections. But as we'll see, almost all these symptoms, even in combination, can be seen with other diseases of the elderly that can kind of cloud the picture. Asthma in the elderly can often be triggered by environmental exposures, not just air allergens like we talked about, but also irritants, strong odors, things like that. And studies have consistently shown that elderly patients and their physicians frequently overlook symptoms caused by asthma. Uh, so there are several reasons for this that I looked into. One is misconception that asthma is a childhood disease. Some physicians think you kind of grow out of your asthma, so if you're an elderly, we there, it must be something else. 
Symptoms of asthma similar to other diseases in this age group, as we'll talk about more in detail in a minute, but you know, some things to consider would be COPD, CHF, emphysema, all these types of things that you don't really think about in children. Uh, there's a greater differential in adult in general, so a lot of things you wouldn't necessarily think about in children or young adults. And, and they're attributing the natural aging, deconditioning, or frailty of the adult patient, and they're not considering that this is actually underlying asthma. They're kind of attributing things to more of an aging process. So I think one of the big things to be able to differentiate when you're seeing elderly patients with wheezing or respiratory symptoms is, is it asthma, is it COPD, or is it both? Um, so it's extremely difficult sometimes to uh, distinguish asthma from COPD. So you think, well, let's do a methacholine challenge, you know, say if they're, if they're responsive to that, then I would call it asthma. Well, actually, the long health study showed methacholine-induced airway reactivity is present in mild to moderate COPD. COPD patients at 53% of men and 87% of women. So having a positive methacholine really doesn't help you differentiate because you could just be fooled and like the studies uh, showing, a high percent of COPD patients also are reactive to methacholine. So where we, it's important, it's um, much more useful in children. I think it's less useful if you're worried about that. Bronchodilator response, we'll say, well, okay, let's see if they're reversible. Well, 85% of patients with tobacco-related COPD demonstrate bronchodilator reversibility at least once on repeated testing sessions. So they may not show it on any particular session, but if you do repeated sessions, 85% will show reversibility that would meet criteria for the diagnosis of, of asthma, you know, bronchoconstriction that's reversible. So so again, methacholine, not, not as useful as we would think, and bronchodilator response, not necessarily as useful as we would think. So I highlighted some of the clinical characteristics of asthma and contrasted them with COPD. And the ones highlighted in red are going to be the ones that there's less overlap between the two and maybe more useful when you're considering the two diagnoses. So with asthma, if we have wheezing, well, with COPD, we have wheezing. Asthma, we have cough, well, with COPD, we have cough. Chest tightness, both. But reversible on spirometry when ill, uh, it's usually asthma. If a COPD patient is acutely ill, it tends to be irreversible on spirometry with bronchodilation. So that's one uh, finding that you can consider. Uh, copious sputum production in the morning is associated is one of the things that's uh, suggested with COPD. Uh, like we said, positive methacholine doesn't help you too much. History of ASPE and asthma in the family, family history or personal history in the past tends to lend itself more to asthma, but not 100%. And elevated ENO, we talked about that, um, can be helpful, but again, really doesn't quench the diagnosis. And also cigarette smoking can artificially lower your ENO as well. Um, COPD, again, if you have a history of smoking, it's suggestive, but, it, you know, it's still mixed with asthma. A low DLCO, uh, which is the diffusing capacity of, of carbon monoxide, on uh, PFT, that is consistent with COPD, and it's something you can order as part of your pulmonary function assay. And if that's low, it's more suggestive with COPD. And emphysema on chest CT also, of course, would, would lend itself more towards COPD. So if you combine all these things, it becomes a little bit more clear if you have multiple, you know, points in your history that lend itself to one or the other. Uh, also, CHF is the other big one with elderly patients. How do we distinguish asthma versus uh, CHF? Uh, early morning wheezing is a uh, prominent symptom of CHF. It's actually been called cardiac asthma, patients that have early morning wheezing. Uh, so I just contrasted asthma versus CHF. Again, the top few thing points are all Top two points are all pretty consistent with both, but uh, asthma should be reversible on spirometry. CHF should not be. You should have peripheral edema uh, with CHF and also vascular congestion on chest x-ray. shouldn't have an elevated ENO, and there may be a mild reduction in SV1 and FBC. I think that's important to note just because if the person comes in with a PFT from an outside source or you get a PFT and their SV1 and FBC are reduced, if it's a mild reduction, that doesn't automatically mean the person has asthma. It could mean that their CHF is, is contributing to that reduction in the PFTs, and, and you have to look for other signs of CHF, like, like is, is listed on the right thing. Um, so here's a, a good slide of diagnostic testing for each of the major pulmonary conditions that you could see in an elderly patient that you may not be as familiar with in a pediatric setting. So if it's asthma, we're looking at spirometry, methacholine, although we talked about the problems with that. Um, just to highlight a few things here, bronchiectasis, a history of greater than one-fourth cup of sputum per day. You'd want to get out the high-res CT for that. COPD, we talked about good history, 
uh, lung volumes, DLCO, CAT scan, all things to further work that up. Uh, some of the heart problems, of course, you're going to look for uh, echoes, EKGs, uh, BNPs. Um, and then down towards the bottom there, just obesity. Uh, you can do a cardiopulmonary exercise test. So if you think that the person is more of a restrictive process because they're obese and their chest wall is actually being compressed, there are certain things you can do for that. One is an exercise test. Two is looking at the expiratory reserve volume on the pulmonary function test. If their expiratory reserve volume is very low and they're obese, that again would lend itself to them having more of a restriction in their ability to uh, uh, exhale fully. Uh, else here. Restrictive lung disease, we talked about lung volumes. You can order lung volumes as part of your pulmonary functions. You can do the DLCO. A, a simple, a simple uh, relatively cheap thing is ambulatory oximetry, where you actually have the person walk around, check their O2 sats, and see if they're dropping their O2 sats uh, with ambulation. And the other thing to consider in, uh, in adults is upper airway obstructions. So when you get your full volume loop, you can ask for, ask for inspiratory loops, um, and you can also directly visualize the uh, upper airway with laryngoscopy. So to complicate things further, uh, one elderly patient likely has more than one cause. So it's, in elderly patients, it tends not to be any one thing, and it's hard to sometimes uh, figure out which is which. So their underlying problem may be dyspnea, but then you can see all those related things, and they could all be contributing. They could have GERD plus asthma, plus some deconditioning, plus obesity, you know, plus just some age-related changes. So it's, as, it's the physician's job, I think, to, to tease out which of these things is normal aging, which is a pathology that needs treated and, and kind of that's a spectrum of following up the patient, seeing how your treatments have worked and reassessing things. Uh, but some things in the elderly patient that I just put as don't miss things. So, you know, patients can come in with COPD and asthma and CHF and GERD and all those things and, and you kind of can take your time and try and figure out what's going on. But you don't want to miss the following things. Pulmonary embolism, upper airway obstruction, that could be a tumor, uh, cardiac related issues, and lung cancers. So those are things, none of which I are on the top of my mind in a pediatric world uh, in the normal set of circumstances. Those are things that are in the normal set of circumstances for adult patients. And those are the things you don't want to write off with asthma without really looking into them. Uh, and then another uh, syndrome that I found uh, particularly interesting, I saw a patient uh, recently with this, and um, it's not something we really think about in children very often, but it's, it's something you should think about in adults which is reactive airway dysfunction syndrome, or RADS. Some, about, some people call it RADD, but uh, I found that it's RADS. It's the development of respiratory symptoms within minutes to hours after a single accidental inhalation of a high concentration of an irritant, gas, aerosol, or smoke. The initial symptoms are followed by asthma-like symptoms and airway hyper-responsiveness that persists for a prolonged period. So as opposed to occupational asthma, where you're around something and when, you're, when you remove that trigger, the patient's symptoms go away. This is actually an inciting event from a single exposure, usually, of a highly irritant, irritating or toxic substance. And it actually basically induces asthma in them after that. And their airways will remain hyper-responsive for prolonged periods of time. In the lady I saw, she said she had mixed ammonia and bleach together to try and clean her house very thoroughly. Which, emitted, which emits a, a toxic chlorine-like gas, and she inhaled that in, and she was very specific that that was the initial trigger of her breathing problems. Never had asthma, never had COPD, never had breathing problems before. You saw that patient too? And, and she was very specific this was the trigger, and then since that point forward, she had chronic issues with hyperactive uh, airways and, you know, um, responding to albuterol and basically developed into an asthmatic looking patient. So the diagnostic criteria for this syndrome is a documented absence of previous respiratory complaints. The onset of symptoms should occur after a single exposure, specific exposure. The exposure should be to a gas, smoke, fume, or vapor with irritant qualities that was present in very high concentrations. The onset of symptoms should occur within 24 hours of exposure and should persist for at least three months. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be an immediate five, after like five minute thing, it can be up to 24 hours. Um, so you need to ask that in your history. The symptoms should uh, simulate asthma with cough, breathing, and dyspnea. Pulmonary function tests may or may not show airflow obstruction, so you don't have to diagnose the CFT, but a methacholine should be positive because if they're 
lungs became hyperactive from this inciting event, they should have a positive methacholine. And of course, other pulmonary diseases should be ruled out. Uh, so here are some causes. I tried to just highlight the ones that I thought were the most prevalent in our normal uh, encounters here. So things like ammonia, bleach, we talked about chlorine, cleaning agents, diesel, fire, smoke, formaldehyde, floor polish, spray paint, gas, and then you can see some of the other more rare things that, that can be associated with this. Um, the list can go on and on, but the big thing is it should be a high dose of a ir strongly irritating substance. So that's it. If anyone had any questions, um, I guess we can go back to the pretest really quick and just probably know the answers. But. Uh, so abnormal deaths are more common among children compared to the elderly. What do you guys think? False, right? False. Uh, and I would not expect an elderly COP patient to have a positive methacholine inhalation challenge. That's also false. Yeah, because they can have a significant percent actually still can. So, anyone have any questions? Thank you. Definitely a lot more complicated than pediatric patients. Right. There's so many different things that you have to think about. Sure. Oh. Thank you, Mark. That was great. Any, anybody else have any, any questions for uh, Dr. Sirota about asthma and the elderly? Um, Paul, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, that was great, Mark. I appreciated that. Um, I um, noticed um, when you were giving your differential um, that it's not so easy even for seasoned physicians to know that they're in heart failure. <laughs> So just keep that in mind. <laughs> so you don't treat your own family. All right. Well, with that uh, in mind, I guess we're going to go ahead and stop here. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>